right. Well, good evening, everyone. So good to see you. And uh, those uh, were here, and Jesus is here, and that's what matters. And I'm just so thankful to see every one of you tonight. We're going to worship the Lord. Amen. We're going to praise Him because He's been so good to us. And we have, we have, we as children of God, we have everything to be thankful for. Amen. We are thankful. Thank God for, in all things, give thanks. So let's all stand to our feet tonight as we just prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. You know, tonight it, it, you may have, uh, you may be tired in your body. Uh, we may be tired in our body, but tonight, you know, we can just focus, not focus on our tiredness, but focus on him. Praise God. Amen. Father, we just come before you tonight in the name of Jesus. Lord, we're just expecting you, Lord, to move tonight, that you would have your way. Lord, we glorify your name, and we lift you up. We thank you. We invite your presence here tonight. Lord, have your way. We love you, Jesus. We praise you. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven And all my praise belongs to you forever my testimony from death to life oh cause grace rewrote my story I testify oh by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified oh this is my testimony this is my testimony anybody saved tonight hallelujah oh, come together Together, sons and daughters, marked with blood and washed in water, sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Oh my God will finish what He started. Oh, I know my God will finish what He started. Oh, this is my testimony from death to life. Oh, cause grace rewrote my story, I'll testify, oh, by Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified, oh, this is my testimony, this is my testimony, this is my testimony, from death to life, oh, cause grace rewrote my story, I'll testify, oh, by Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified, oh, this this is my testimony, this is my testimony. Oh, thank you, Lord. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Oh, greater things are still to come. Lord, I believe. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Oh, no. Greater things are still to come. Lord, I believe if I'm not dead, then you're not done. Oh, greater things are still to come. Lord, I believe if I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Lord, I believe this is my testimony from death to life. Story, and I'll testify. Oh, by Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. Oh, this is my testimony. This is my testimony. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Oh, no, greater things are still to come. The Lord, I believe. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Oh, greater things are still to come. Lord, I believe this is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify oh, by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. Oh, this is my testimony. This is my testimony. our 
provider. Amen. He's the river in the desert. Thank you, Jesus. This is the word of the Lord, your creator. I am the God who stood before the world was framed. Hold your future, who could know these things but me? So don't fear, I will be your song. Sing, sing, O barren land, water is coming to the thirsty. Well, draw from me, I will provide. So sing, 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 O oh barren land. Water is coming to the thirsty. Though you are empty, oh, I am the well. Draw from me, I will provide. is the word of the Lord, your creator. I stand from age to age. Oh, I stand from age to age, the ancient of days. And I am the Holy One, the fairest of ten thousand. Oh, and all who call I will be your song. Sing, sing, O barren land. Water is coming to the thirsty. Though you are empty, I am the well. Draw from me, I will provide.
making rivers in the desert, oh, he's making ways in the wilderness, he's making rivers in the desert, can we just sing, you are the way, you are the way in the wilderness, yes, you are, Lord, you're the river in the desert, you are the way, you are the way in the wilderness. Yes, you are. You are the river in the desert. Mm, so sing, sing, O oh barren land. Water is coming to the thirsty. No, you are empty. Oh, I am the well. Draw from me, I will provide. Yes, no, you are empty. Oh, I am the well. Draw from me, I will provide. So draw from me, draw from me, I will provide. Oh, he won't leave us empty. Oh, no, he won't leave us empty. No, oh, I'll draw from God, He says, draw from me, I will provide. Oh, and draw from me, I will provide. Oh, yes, draw from me, I will provide. Oh, because He loves us. Oh, how He loves us.
You know, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, Paul said, be, be not drunk with wine in which is dissipation. It just, it just dissipate, dissipates. It goes away. It's temporal. But he said, but be filled with the Spirit. And tonight I just sense in my spirit, just from these songs that we've sang, the Lord wants us to be filled tonight. He wants to fill us to overflowing. Not just with His Spirit, but fill us with His hope. Fill us with peace. Fill us with joy. Fill us with fulfillment. Fill us with victory. He paid for it. Jesus, it's already paid for. All we got to do is just ask, believe, and receive. So if there's anything tonight, if there's a void in any way, if there's, a, if there's an emptiness in any way tonight, the Lord, as we're going to sing it again, we're gonna just, I just ask, I challenge you, just lift up your hands as a, as a vessel. Say, Lord, would you fill me? Come on, Lord, would you fill me? Lord, would you just fill me to overflowing? Let that be your prayer tonight. The Lord, Jesus wants to fill us tonight. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. provide do you believe that tonight praise the lord he's a he is a well that we draw from jesus as he's the living water praise the lord hallelujah praise the lord before you're seated tonight you just turn around and just greet someone just say just say welcome to somebody tonight praise the lord be seated afterwards. Praise God. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We got a couple Brandons in the house. We got a couple Ethans in the house. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and I think that's the only duo names that we have, but <laughs> uh, it's so good to see you tonight. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, the Lord is good, amen, and his mercy endures forever. You know, I will never forget, you know, when I was a, uh, just a little boy, I remember going to church and people were lifting their hands and, and some people would be, you know, I won't go through it all, but some people would be spread out like this, they call it airplane, you know, airplane worship, you know, just <laughs> it's going to take off. And then some people were like touchdown, you know, touchdown praises, you know. And there were other people. And I just kind of intrigued by it all, just as a young person. I asked my mom, said, Mom, after service, I said, Mom, how come the people, you know, they, they, they lift their hands? And, 
you can, you know, just wondering, well, what's that about? And she said, well, it's in the Bible. We lift up our hands. But he said, Bobby, he said, just, it's like just you're a cup and you're lifting up your hands. And it's like, Lord, would you just fill me? You, your hands are like just like a big cup. Lord, would you fill me? And she said, Bob, that's what those people are doing. They're worshiping God and they're saying, Lord, would you fill me? And I tell you, it doesn't matter if you're one, if we're young or if we're older. It doesn't matter. I tell you, it's biblical. It's right to just lift up holy hands. Hallelujah! Glory to God. Because hey, we we got something to thank you for, but we also need Him to touch us and fill us up. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You got something. You got something. Oh, glory to His name. To my heart was the blood of life. Glory to His name. Oh, glory to His name. Glory to His name. Oh, there to my heart was the blood. cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood of fire. Was the blood of my glory to his name? Oh, and I am so wondrously saved from sin. Oh, Jesus, so sweetly abides within. Oh, down at the cross where he took me in, I'm singing. It's completely worth it. It's completely worth it to praise Him. Hallelujah. It's completely worth it. Praise God. Hallelujah. This is eternal. A football game, as much as this, ain't nothing wrong with loving football. I love football, I love sports. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But you know what? That's temporal. But this is eternal. Because when we look in, in the Bible, Revelation chapter 4 and 5, we're going to be there one day. Well, you know what? When we, get, when we get around the throne, we won't be playing cornhole. We won't be playing board games. Nothing wrong with that. No, we're going to be worshiping the Lord. Hallelujah. Because we were created to worship Him. And there's that Jesus-shaped void in every person's heart that only Jesus can fill. Hallelujah. 
my Lord, and he fills it every single day. Not just on Sundays, not just on midweek, but every single day. Jesus is the one who fills that void. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, Lord, we got a song in our heart tonight. Oh, I feel it. We got a song in our heart because he's worthy. from sin oh, and I am so glad I have entered in oh and Lord Jesus saves me and keeps me clean singing glory to his name singing glory to his name glory to his name Glory, glory, oh hallelujah, oh since I've laid my burdens down, glory, glory, hallelujah, since I've laid my burdens down, oh yes, glory, glory, oh hallelujah, oh since I've laid Those shackles just have to fall at our feet. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. You may be seated tonight. Oh, the Lord is here. Amen. The Lord is here. He's in the midst of his people. He always is. You know, it is no accident that the longest book in the Bible is the book of Psalms, which is, it's, which is God's praise book. And again, there's no accident. That, that's, that shows the priority that God puts on praise. The longest book in the Bible, the book of Psalms. Psalms means songs of worship. And so, praise the Lord. We were created to worship Him. Amen. The Lord is so good. Again, it's so good to see every single one of you tonight. I'm so glad you came out. I'm sure there'll be more uh, tomorrow, but we're here. And I'm just so, we're so blessed tonight to have uh, Pastor Brandon Trott with us. And uh, praise the Lord. It's so good to have along along with with uh josh and aaron jo oh jonathan and aaron i'm sorry okay, <laughs> sorry. okay. <laughs> jonathan and aaron it's good to have you here and and the whole crew will be here tomorrow morning but um they're they're here and uh the rest of his crew will fill up that whole side of the church over here <laughs> i'm only joking <laughs> but we love we love brandon uh pastor brandon so much um, he is from North Carolina, and uh, <clears throat> but he came to Bible College. He was one of our students there, and graduated and and pastored for a good number of years. They can, he can talk about that if he wants to. But but in Bro Bridge, Louisiana, and uh, this man is just a man of God. He's a, is a man of God, and and he's genuine. And there's so many different words I could use to describe him. All good, but uh, we're just so blessed that he is here. And uh, praise the Lord. Do you want to, are you ready to hear God's word tonight? Praise the Lord. Work. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So we're going to welcome Pastor Brandon Trout to this pulpit. Won't you come and bless us tonight? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Take, take your freedom, brother. Amen. 
Praise God. It's good to be with you tonight in the presence of the Lord. If you would, please open your Bible with me to the book of James, the book of James chapter 4. I want to say it's such a privilege to be here with Pastor Bob and Sister Sharon. They mean the world to me, and I can honestly say that there are a few people who have meant as much to me in my walk with the Lord uh, and my understanding of the Word of God and my love for the things of God as this family. And I praise God for them, and you're a blessing to me, brother. You taught me a lot. You ministered to me a lot. You were gracious towards me and kind towards me, and I'm very grateful for the ways that you nurtured the calling and the gift of God in me, and I just appreciate you. Thank you for that. And my sister, I've seen your faith and your service to the Lord, and uh, I've seen the things that you went through, not from as close as some others have seen it, uh, but I know that your faith was there and the call of God was there and the work of God was there, and it's wonderful to see that come into pass the way that it is now. We praise God for you. You're a blessing to us. So we thank the Lord for them and thank the Lord for the privilege to be here uh, with you fine people, to worship, to pray, to seek God together. I encourage you to do everything that you can to support this church, this ministry, the work of God that's going on here. We live in a day where the enemy is full on attacking the house of God. And can I tell you, the way that he's doing it is the main thing that I see is he is attacking it by apathy, that he is leading us into the temptation of taking the things of God unseriously. And the church is just asleep. And many ministers are wearing out. They are tired because they want to see the people of God on fire for the Lord. And they feel like they're giving all of the fuel to the fire and they're burning out. And they're tired and they're weary. And so hold up your pastor's arms. Hold up Sharon's arms. Serve them. Encourage them. Love them. If God gives them a vision for the things of God, support it. Stand behind it. Encourage it. Look for opportunities to help them carry on the vision. Not for their sake. God did not ask them, do you want to be in ministry? When God calls a man, He makes a sovereign choice and He says, you belong to me. And the opportunity to make choices is gone. I've made a determination that your life will be poured out on the altar of my will. And that life that has been poured out has been poured out for souls. For people who don't know God and are facing an eternity of judgment to come to know His grace. For people who are sheep of the Lord, but are lost and deceived and wandering and confused to come into a sure knowledge of the Word of God and of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and they are dying for the lack of it. And your support, your making this a living place that draws people and ministers to people and serves souls will mean the difference between it being effective or ineffective. Amen? The man of God can't carry it alone. It takes the people of God. And all the man of God is, is a step into the people of God being what they were called to be. Amen? They're not the super spiritual, super powerful ones. All they are is a servant to get you on fire for Jesus. Amen? God never said that the world, that the preachers would be the manifestation of the wisdom that would destroy the powers and taunt the powers of hell. But in Ephesians chapter 3, he does say that the church is the thing that he will use to boast against the powers and the wisdom of hell and use them as a token of grace and say, you know what you've done, devil, through the power of sin and temptation and destruction, but look what I'm doing through a living church, through a saved and a sanctified people. And so I encourage you, saints of God, to let that grace be at work in your life. And I know that you are, and I see the desire in your heart. Thank you for your ministry to the body of Christ here and for your service to me. I, I appreciate you. I do want to thank and honor my boys. Aaron, 11, is my oldest, and Jonathan, 9, is the second oldest. And uh, we have... Uh, ten, you just turned ten. That's right. Amen. And I have uh, I have four more uh, who we just we just got done with a camping trip. We we can't we drove from 
Baton Rouge Tuesday to uh, Mississippi and camped at a campground there and continued up the Natchez Trace and camped at the Meriwether Lewis campground up here in Tennessee uh, Thursday and Friday and packed up this morning and we weren't able to get into the hotel till almost five o'clock and so my wife is trying to get the thick sheen of campground off of my other children. Uh, I took a quick shower, and to be honest with you, if, if I'm overcompensating with cologne right now, there, there may be a reason for that. I feel like a two-hour shower might be what's more needed. But uh, my wife, Tessa, uh, is at the hotel now with my other children, Anna, Jessica, Arthur, and Joy. And my children and my wife are the real uh, heroes of our ministry because they travel with me, they serve with me, they pray with me, they encourage me, uh, and it's my faith that God will use them for the next generation. And so I just thank God for them. So if you will, please turn with me to James chapter 4. James chapter 4 and verse 8. A very simple text, not very difficult to understand, but can I tell you, there is so much in the Word of God that is difficult to understand and needs to be taught and helped. But mostly the Word of God is not difficult to understand. It is difficult to live. And what is needed is an application by the Holy Ghost of that Word to our heart so that we can live what we know. Amen? Yeah. Praise God. Most of you probably don't need to go to another conference, another camp meeting, another event to get to learn some new knowledge. What you need is the Holy Ghost to make real in your life what you already know. Amen. Praise God for camp meetings. I was just in one. Praise God for services and conferences. And I want to learn more. But I can tell you, I could spend the rest of my life trying to learn to live what I already know right now. And it wouldn't be enough time. Amen. And so my desire tonight is not to just teach you truth, but to stir up the spirit that's in you, that inner man, to say, oh God, let it be real in my life. James chapter 4 and verse 8. The Apostle James says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. And so we have this statement, these two statements that I want to hang on to, when he says, draw near to God, and He'll draw near to you. And then this statement, purify your hearts, you double-minded. And so there is this sense that these people are the people of God. But there are things in their life that don't reflect God and don't reflect the relationship and the intimacy with God that they're supposed to have. And he's saying you need to right this ship. You need to turn this ship. You need to deal with your heart. You need to recognize that you are talking about a God and you're going to a church service to worship a God and speak about a God that you are not near as close to as you think you are and the way that you treat other people and the way that you live and the things that you're doing testify to you that you are not close to this God as you ought to be. And I tell you tonight, the realness of the Christian life is this. It is intimacy with God. It is knowing God. It is getting close to God because you can sit in theology classes all day long and you can know everything in the book from cover to cover and be no closer to God than any atheist who's, who's cursing his name right now. The reality is this. I want to know the living God. I want to be the friend of the living God. I want to be close to the living God enough in a way that his power and his love and his righteousness and his life is manifest in me. Amen. Praise God. And so he says to them, draw near to God. Get close to God. And we find that this is a matter of the heart. And we'll go to Isaiah 29 in a moment to see how drawing near to God, our proximity to God, is a matter of the heart. And he, so, so he says, draw near to God. And then he says, to purge or cleanse your hearts, you double-minded. You double-minded. Your heart is for God and you. Your heart is for God and for pride. Your heart is for God and for lust. 
Your heart is for God and your image. Your heart is for God and for money. Your heart is pulled between two places and it's getting you further and further away from the Lord because you've only got one heart and you're trying to act like you've got two. Amen? You're trying to act like you got two. And the closer you get to these other things, the further that you get away from the Lord. Amen? And so he says, you've got a double heart. And so purify your heart. Get those things that are in your heart out of your heart. Amen. And some of it may not even be things you need to get out of your life. There are lots of good things that God gives us that are not sin, that are not wrong, that are not bad, not evil. But it gets so in our heart that it pulls us away from the Lord. Amen? How many of you remember Deuteronomy where God warns the people of Israel, I'm going to send you into a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to send you a plate to a place with vineyards you didn't plant, houses you didn't build. I'm going to send you into a place to flourish. But when you get the stuff... The stuff that I give you. First Timothy 6, God has richly given us all things to enjoy. Enjoy it. He made it for you. The world is for you. Pleasure is for you. Entertainment is for you. All things were made by God for you to be enjoyed by you. And the world is out there enjoying God's stuff and cursing His name. God's people ought to be able to enjoy those things and give Him praise. But they shouldn't let it pull their heart from Him. He says, once you get those things, don't forget me. Don't forget me. Don't seek my face. Get my hand. And then you get so entertained with the things in my hand, you don't want my face anymore. And you begin to drift away to other things. And so he simply says this, draw near to God. And I want to speak to you about that tonight. Let's pray and ask God to help us. God Almighty, we need a help of the Holy Ghost. Lord, you see my heart. Lord, I have been in a long season where, Lord, I have confessed to you many times, Lord, that I've tried to get closer. And, Lord, pain and grief and sorrow and suffering has pulled me what feels like away from your heart. But, oh, God, my confession to you is, Lord, I need your love. I need your grace. I need your presence. Lord, I need the help of the Holy Ghost, God. And, Lord, with all of my heart, I want to pursue you. With all of my heart, I want to know you. You're the greatest treasure of my life, Lord. Lord, I've never had a time where I've received more from the hand of the Lord and seen the blessing more from the hand of the Lord. And I've tasted it and said it's nothing. It could all be gone tomorrow. All of it could be destroyed by the moth and the flame. God Almighty, I don't want to store up treasures on earth. Oh, but treasures in heaven. God, I want my heart to be there in heaven where you are seated. God Almighty, with your kingdom and your power and your glory. God Almighty, help your people tonight. Lord, if their heart is not near to you, let them see it. God Almighty, open their eyes. Lord, the devil that would make their eyes milky and sick God so that they can't see and they can't discern and they would say that we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and we're okay and our heart is fine and God would say you're not fine you're blind and miserable cold and naked your heart's dying and it's far from the altar but you're so deceived because you don't even know that you're far away God open their eyes to see Lord let them begin the journey of faith Back to your presence and God Almighty for the heart that's near. But it's being drawn and pulled and tempted and other things are being offered to it. God Almighty in Jesus name. Let it see the glory of your heart. The beauty of your heart. The goodness of your heart. That it would cherish it above everything and say Lord. Whatever I have to let hold of your heart for. To get I don't want. God Almighty help us to be people tonight that draw near to God. Lord, in faith that you'll draw near to us. Help us tonight in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. James was speaking to these people who were Christians, who were followers of Jesus. But if you read the book of James, their, their life looked nothing like what Jesus said that our lives ought to look like. There was full of, they were full of contention 
arguing. They were taking advantage of one another. They were boasting about who had the nicer clothes and who had more wealth. And the people with wealth were oppressing those who were poor. And they were harsh and wicked with their tongue, cutting people. And he says that this tongue is an unruly evil set on fire by hell. And it's going to destroy and burn down everything that God's building in the church. And he's warning them against all of these sins. And he gets to chapter 4 and he says the problem is this it is simply this you are adulterous it's simply this it's not a very complicated issue that you're adulterers and adulteresses that your heart is covenantally given to God it was maybe they even went to covenant church pastor Bob they saw themselves as the bride of Christ and married to the Lord and we love you and we thank God for a new covenant and we thank God for grace and we're your people but they betrayed the Lord with other things. And he says, you adulterers and adulteresses, your heart is given over to other things. And this is why you're bearing all this wicked seed, right? There's, that's the reason why there's all this fruit of one thing. There's the fruit of faith. And many of you are suffering and, and you're still trusting the Lord and, and you're still loving God and you're worshiping and you're, you're really going through a difficult time and you're still claiming Jesus. Praise God for that fruit that you're bearing. But you're also bearing wicked fruit. And it's because there is a covenant and an intimacy with God that is bearing fruit in your life. But then there is an intimacy with the world and with sin that is a betrayal that you're bearing the fruit of the devil in your life. And that's the reason there's this mixture that's going on. You're adulterers and adulteresses and you're bearing seed. You're producing children of life and children of death. You've got Isaacs and Ishmael's. You've got spirit and you've got flesh. You've got sin and you've got righteousness. And he's saying the same thing. Remember that God told Abraham, I'm sorry. I pity her. I pity Hagar. I don't want this woman to go through a wilderness. I don't want a baby to be cast out. But you brought her into your bed. I didn't do this. And you cannot let them grow up together. you got to cast out the bond woman. you gotta, you got to get rid of this division that's in your house. And he says here, this, this heart that's given to the Lord and given to sin, draw near to God. Amen. Draw near to Him. Draw near. And he says at the beginning of this passage, when he tells them that they're adulterers, he said, do you not know that the Spirit of the Lord is jealous? He's jealous over you. And yet, he says, if you draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. If you've been married, you know that you have imagined what you would do if you ever found out that your spouse had cheated on you. You know, it has crossed your mind. You've thought, what if this happened? What if I heard? What if I found out? And the, the moments, especially if you're a Christian wrestling, thinking, I, I hate you. I can't believe you betrayed me. I'd never forgive you. And then going, but I'm called to forgive and I'm called. To... But that feeling of betrayal, that feeling of being let down and sold out. And he says, you're adulterers and adulteresses. And God's jealous over you. But if you draw near, He'll draw near. He won't put up a barrier and say, you don't get to come back over here. You polluted the covenant. You polluted our relationship. You were bearing fruit for righteousness and then fruit for sin. And you betrayed me and you let me down. And you let sin in to where only I was supposed to be. He says, God is here now gnawing at you, pulling you, wooing you, calling you. Even now through this letter of warning saying, if you simply come to him. He'll come to you. If you pursue intimacy with Him, you will get intimacy. I marvel at the grace of God. I, I don't understand. I don't understand. When I got saved, I marveled that God would love me. But, but I realized that I was in so much ignorance of the wonder and the beauty and the glory of God that there, you almost think, well, maybe there's an excuse. But over the last... What, 17 years, 18 years that I've been saved, there have been so many times my heart has wandered and there was no excuse. And I'm amazed at how he still 
pursues me, how he still calls me, how he still longs for me, and how many times he receives me over and over again. Come home. Come home. I love you. I love you. I'll wash you. I'll cleanse you. I will make you new. And he says, draw near to God. Isn't this the contradiction? Most people think that James is a graceless book. It's a legalistic book. Martin Luther said that it's an epistle of straw. This, this doesn't seem to jive with the message of Paul the Apostle in grace. Does it not? You're adulterers. But if you just begin to get close to God, He'll get close to you. This is a book full of grace because I wouldn't give these people any shot. Just the law for you. Just destroy. Just go and leave. You are under the judgment of God. No second chances. No repentance. And this is a book saying you people are absolutely awful. And we've never known church people like that. So we really got to use our imagination. We've never been that. So really, if you can, just try to imagine this, this scenario. And he says, for all of that, if you'll just come back, that you'll get received. It's not a thousand mile journey. It's not a hard, it's not a long. Just draw near, I'll draw near. You come close, I'll come close. Quit pushing me away and I'll get close again. And so he says, draw near to God. But how do we draw near? How do we draw near? We must understand that drawing near is a matter of the heart. It says in Isaiah 29 and verse 13, and you can turn there with me. I just want you to see it with me. Isaiah 29 and verse 13. I was listening for pages turning, but y'all got the Bible out. Y'all are quick with it, huh? You got those super fast thumbs. All right. Isaiah 29, 13 says, And the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a command taught by men. So he says they're, they're doing the church activities. They're, they're still singing the songs. They're, they're still reading the Tanakh. They're still, they're still talking about God. They're still worshiping. They're still praying. They're still tithing. They're still doing all the outward signs. And people who look at them would go, you're close to God. And he says, but I know this people. And while they are physically near, their hearts are far. Amen? Now, if I can correct something real quick, just, just I doubt this is here, but I'll just say it. One thing that I've seen is I've, I've seen the total opposite from a lot of immature, mostly younger believers who will take that and say, oh, well, God judges the heart and not the outward act. And here are all these people with the outward act, but not the heart. And so they think that the outward act is not important. And I'll, I'll be spiritual while I worship at home. And I'll be holy while I, I pray. I pray by my bed. So I don't need to go to church. I don't need to tithe. I don't need to serve. I don't need to give. I don't need to minister. I don't need to clean toilets. I don't need to share the gospel. And they just think, well, as long as I love the Lord in my heart and I, I honor Him in my own way and I've got my own way of serving Him and they, they're so carnal that they think they're spiritual. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's, there's an inversion of everything. The more carnal you are, the more spiritual you are. The less you don't care about righteousness or unrighteousness, the more gracious you are. There's all of this topsy-turvy town that we're kind of in in Christianity now. People are just lost and confused. So we're not saying, oh, well, just honor the Lord in your heart, but don't follow through with any action. He says, no, the point is that it has to start in the heart. It has to start in the heart. And so this is what I'm asking you tonight. Not through your actions would you interpret that there is a love for God and a nearness to God. That you would evaluate your own heart and you would ask the Lord this. Lord, what do you say about me? How many times in the Word of God do people say things about themselves that God says the opposite? 
Go read the book of Malachi. Verse after verse after verse. This people, they, they, they don't serve God. They don't honor me. They don't obey me. How do we not obey you, right? How do we not serve you? How do we not, not, not love you with all of our heart? And then the Lord gives these ways that they don't love him with their heart. What about the churches of Revelation where you have a reputation that you're alive, but you're dead? Right? You say, I'm, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, but really you're poor and you have no clothing, you're naked, and, and you're dead inside. And there's all of this contradiction between your interpretation of your heart and God's interpretation of your heart. Can I tell you, this is why worship and prayer is so important, because I'm not listening to a preacher going, do I agree with that or not? Does that line up with the Bible or not? This is just me and the Lord, and I'm going, where am I? Am I really loving you? Am I really pouring my heart out to you? Is there sincerity here? Because you can't fool him. Amen? You can't deceive him. You can't trick him. There are no games. There's no pretense. There's no charades with God. God's never seen anyone done anything go, Oh my gosh, I can't believe. No, he knew the end from the beginning. He knows your heart. This is why confession is such a sweet gift. We're not informing God of something that he didn't know. Lord, I was unkind to my wife. <gasps> How could you? Like he, he already knew. It's agreeing with God that what he calls sin, you recognize as sin. And you're saying, Lord, if, if really I'm as sinful as you know that I am, then I need the solution that you offer. I need the blood of Jesus. Amen? And so he's saying this is a heart issue. And you can deceive people. You can play games with people, but God really knows your heart. And so my question to you tonight is, are you willing to let God search your heart? Are you willing to let God examine your heart? He said, they draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. When he says draw near to God, can I tell you tonight? This is something that every Christian must do, and it is not a one-time thing. It's not like a boat that is out at sea, and then you draw it into the shore, and you anchor it there, and it just stays there. This is a constant action of getting closer and closer to Jesus and saying, Lord, everything that's between me, between me and you has got to get out of the way. Amen? We need to be getting nearer and nearer and nearer to the Lord. Can I tell you this? All that is required for backsliding is for the heart to do nothing. Amen? All that is required for the heart to backslide is to do nothing. It will go astray by default. It will go astray all on its own. Amen? Praise God. If the shepherd is not constantly leading me, constantly correcting me, if I'm not constantly listening for his voice, sensitive to the prodding of his staff, if I'm not constantly saying, where are the feet of my shepherd so that I can follow, can I tell you like that, my heart will be gone after other things. And you know how sheep go astray? One blade of grass at a time. One blade of grass. All, the only reason that sheep go astray is simply this. They're not, they're not evil. They're not moral beings. They're not saying, oh, I don't want to go your way. They're just concerned with what can I eat? What can I get? And so if they just think, oh, well, there's a blade of grass, and I'll go and eat that, and then there's another one, I'll go eat that, and I'll go eat that, and they just wander. They're not thinking. They're not mindful. They're not aware. They're just not paying attention to the shepherd, and they just get lost. One of my favorite hymns says, Lord, my heart, prone to wander, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Lord, how, how can I love you? How can I want you above everything else? And then just one day look up and go, how did I get here? And where's Jesus? His feet were right there. And now I can't even see him. I don't even know where he is. I've lost my shepherd. I've gotten distracted. I've gotten focused on other things. Can I just be real honest with y'all tonight? I wasn't planning on being this honest. Just, just, just sharing with you from personal experience. Part of the reason that there's been a change in my season in, in ministry is this. The last decade I've served as the pastor of New Beginning Fellowship Church. And it has been 
one of the most incredible, wonderful experiences of my life, and I'm very grateful for it. But I came into that church in a very dire situation, and it really was 10 years of just incessantly beating the drum, trying, striving, laboring, building the church, ministering to the school, preparing things, getting things in order. And it just took so much time and attention that, to be honest with you, the last three or four years, my heart has been so tired, I felt like I could barely go on another day in the last year and a half as a pastor. Every Sunday, I felt like I had nothing to give. I would go sit at the coffee shop or in my office to study and pray, and my heart was so weary, I couldn't pray. I would sit before an open Bible and just, I can't do it. This is, I mean, and my my habit was 14 hours for every sermon and, and just praying as often as possible, seeking the Lord. But here's what I found out. This is nothing to do with the church, not their fault, not even my fault, just a growing experience that I was so busy ministering for Jesus, doing the work of the Lord, that I didn't have enough time to just be with Him. And my prayers were, Lord, the people, this marriage, their finances, their health, you know what they're going through. Lord, the the finances for the church, that we need to build this and we need to do this. Lord, help me to do that. Give me wisdom for this decision. Give me a message for this. Help me to counsel this family. Help me to rescue this this family or this soul that is backsliding and uh, falling away from the Lord. And it just took so much out of me. And you remember when Jesus had sent his disciples to go and preach and they came back and they're so excited. Even the demons leave at your name and we've preached and we've testified and we've healed and the work of God has been wonderful and we're so excited. Okay. Come away with me for a little while. Let's just go get in a boat. No ministry, no agenda. We're just going to go from one side to the other. We're just going to spend some time together. It's good that you're so excited about ministry, but don't be so busy doing the work of Jesus. You forget that you're doing it because you love Jesus. And I'm just in a season where I'm having to say to the Lord, Lord, I just need you to renew me. Help me, Lord. You know, and and it's just... It's just a season where I need to just get closer to the Lord again, not for other people, but just because I love Him, just because He's my friend. You know, those priests, every time they went into the Holy of Holies, every time they went into that inner near place, they would have to have on the breastplate and the the garments. And on that breastplate were 12 stones, six on this side and six on the other, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And every time they went in, they carried the people with them. And they carried the people out. And that's what I felt like the last 10 years of my life were, just constantly carrying the people in before the Lord. And it's good, and praise God, that's wonderful. But I just wasn't mindful enough of my own heart that I needed some time to be able to go, I'm carrying the people in. But sometimes y'all got to stay out there, and me and Jesus just got to talk. And I was not as close to the Lord personally because I was too close to Him for His ministry, right? And so I'm just in a season where I'm, I'm willing to love you, I'm willing to serve you, I'm willing to help you, but I'm just in a season where I'm just saying, Lord, I just want to know you. I just want to be close to you. I just want my heart to be near I don't want to be focused on just doing your work. I want to remember why I wanted to do this in the first place because I was so in love with you. The idea that people didn't know you broke my heart. And so he says to the people that your heart can be far from him. So many things can pull you away. Can I tell you the weeds weeds of anxiety, the thorns of belief, and the vines of compromise will grow all on their own if they are simply neglected. The heart that doesn't pray gets cold. The hands that aren't serving others will be available for evil works. The mouth that isn't filled with thanksgiving will be filled with complaining. The attitude that isn't constantly recalibrated towards grace will automatically become critical. The soul that doesn't cry, Lord, teach me to love my enemy, will scarcely even love their neighbor. The feet that aren't following after Jesus will follow every temptation. And the mind that is not guarded by the word of God will be a stronghold for every thought that raises itself against the knowledge of God. We have to constantly 
Be seeking the Lord. Be drawing near to the Lord. You're either getting closer to Jesus or you're backsliding. Amen? Because Jesus isn't staying still. Amen? Jesus didn't say, come and camp with me and hang out here. He said, come and follow me. You want to be with me? We're moving together. I'm going somewhere. You come with me. And if you stay, you get left behind. Amen? Praise God. Jesus isn't going to leave you where you are. Praise God. Jesus wants to move you forward in the things of God. And so as we're talking about getting near to God, I want to remind you that by the grace of God, you have been brought near. Amen? By the blood of Jesus. It says in Ephesians 2, verse 11 to 13, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, In Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so I want to tell you that by grace, you are near to Jesus. By the blood, you are near to God. You were far away and you've been brought near. But we've been brought near by the blood of Jesus. But can I tell you this? You must draw nearer still by faith in the blood of Jesus. Amen? You have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. But you must draw nearer still by faith in the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 10, 19-22 says this. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain that is through His flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So we've been brought near by the blood of Jesus. But that doesn't mean that we just say, oh, well, Jesus died on the cross. That's enough. I just have faith in that. And so I just sit passively and do nothing. And eventually I'll get closer to the Lord. He says, no, you have been brought near by the blood. And if you believe that, pursue him by faith. Seek him by faith. Get in the word. Get in the prayer closet. Be active in worship. Be active in praise. Be active in the altar. Be active in ministering to lost souls. Be active in seeking to love your neighbor and love your enemies. Be active in seeking the Lord for forgiveness and wisdom and godliness and get as close to Him as you can saying, Lord, the blood paid the way for me to get here. In Jesus' name, I want it. In Jesus' name, I believe that I will have it. And so I'll just say to you tonight, if your heart is dead, if your heart is far from the Lord, it is simply the gift of confessing your cold, dead heart that God wants to start the process with. If you say, I'm far off, I am the adulteress, I have uh, abandoned the covenant of the Lord and not been clear near to Him, and I have let other things in, and I need to draw near, and I need to purify my heart and get rid of that double heart and get closer to Him. How do I start that? Can I tell you, it just starts with confession with acknowledging that you're not as close as you need to be and asking the Lord to help you to get nearer. I love Keith Green. I don't know how many of you know Keith Green and his testimony, but this brother was only saved for like six years before he died. I I cannot comprehend six years of being a Christian and what God did in his life. I don't understand how in six years God could do so much in and through one life that just came to a simple understanding of Jesus and followed him. And yet this man who was on fire, this man who inspired millions to walk close to Jesus, wrote these words in one of his songs. He said, My eyes are dry. My faith is old. My prayers are dead. And my heart is cold. They said this, What can be done for an old heart like mine? Please soften it up with the oil and the wine. 
for the oil is you, your spirit of love. Wash me anew in the wine of your blood. He said, Lord, I used to be so near, and now I'm so far. But I'm not going to play games. I'm not going to pretend. I'm not going to act like I'm not. I'm just going to confess it to you. I'm going to acknowledge it to you. If I'm a sheep that's lost, I don't go looking for the shepherd. I'm a dumb sheep. I'll just get lost or -er. I don't know how the proper, I'll get more lost. But if I can begin calling for the master. If I can say, I know that that shepherd is looking for me. I know that he's pursuing me. If I can just begin to cry to him and say, I'm over here. I'm in a pit. I'm in a hole. And I was close to you, but now I'm far away. I know you're seeking me. Come and find me. Then I know the shepherd will come and find me. And we do it by faith. I remind you what it says in Joel chapter 2. Verse 12 to 14, it says, yet even now, declares the Lord. And this yet even now is in the face of all of their wickedness and all of their sin and all the judgment that they're worthy of. And if you read the, the chapter and the verses before this, it's like judgment is certain. Destruction is certain. You're so evil. You've so betrayed the Lord. Yet even now. Oh, how long grace will suffer. How long love will reach out for you. How kind God, he says, yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, and rend your hearts, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and a Bounding in steadfast love. And he relents over disaster. And who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him. A grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Not only will the Lord maybe say, I won't destroy you even though you are utterly worthy of judgment and destruction. He may actually be rewarding you, not only not giving you justice, but may give you more reward than you can even count yourself worthy of. And this has been the testimony of my life. There are immature moments where I looked and I thought, God, don't you see how I love you, how I'm serving you? Why are you not moving in my life? And then when I saw the blessing of the Lord, I was shamed by grace. You were so much kinder to me than I ever deserved. And what you should have said, your service was incomplete and polluted and not worthwhile and so insufficient. Rather, you will say, let me bless you more than you deserve. Who is this God? Who is this God? I'm tired of preaching about him. I'm tired of singing about him. I want to know him. I want to get into his heart. I want to know this God who is so not like me and so not like you and not like anyone you've ever known in your life. I want this Jesus. I want him to pour into the cup of his love and I want to drink it and take all of it to every last drop and say, Lord, I'm so grateful. Not that I get to preach in your name or sing in your name or minister in your name, but Lord, that I get to know you in intimacy. Oh, this is what God has called us to. Draw near to God. Draw near to God. And He will draw near to you. Sam, if you could come. Oh, brothers and sisters, the goodness of God, the grace of God to you is sure tonight. God desires to do something so kind in you, so merciful in you, that it would be a testimony to those out there. There's some cold, hard, dead Christian out there excusing their heart right now, thinking that, well, this is just the way that things are, and I don't have to change, and I can't change, and God's probably sick of me anyway. But if God could get your heart on fire, if God could warm that cold heart, if God could pour that love into that empty heart, if God can just minister to you, if God can just get you closer to Him, oh, how they would see it and be testified to and say, the God that was kind to them may be kind to me. Amen. Praise God. How many of you are thankful that God didn't just say, I'm the God of Abraham and Isaac, but He said, I'm the God of Jacob. He didn't say Israel. He said Jacob, that God that just can't seem to get it right. The God that knows better, that had generations of a testimony about God, that He should have been able to walk by faith, but He just couldn't submit to the Lord. He just couldn't 
didn't get it right, but God found him in the wilderness and wrestled with him until he was subdued. God says, I'm his God. He's mine. And he wants you to be his too. God Almighty, help us. God Almighty, help us. Lord, we need your presence. God, draw me. God, draw me, and I'll run after you. Lord, let my heart cleave to the Lord. Lord, let me purify my heart and not be double-minded anymore, double-hearted anymore. God, I want my heart to be pure. I just want to long for you and love you. I just want to know you, God, how sneaky the things of this life can be that get between us and Jesus. Help us tonight to seek you with all of our heart. Have your way in us. Minister to us, Lord. Minister to your people. Saints, I want to give you an opportunity to come to this altar. If you need the Lord to minister to your heart, if you need God to draw you closer, I ask you, will you take a step of faith? Will you come to this altar and let's pray for you? Let's believe God. Can you just come and let us seek the Lord together? Let us seek the Lord while he may be found. You know, the word of the Lord talks about a season where God's passing by, a season where God is visiting, a season where God is moving. It says of Jesus when he came to minister to the people, it says that they didn't know it was the hour of their visitation. God was coming and giving them an opportunity. God was visiting them in a unique way, in a special way to deal with their hearts and do what needed to be done. But their hearts were hard. Their hearts didn't want to seek the Lord. Their hearts were preoccupied with other things and it kept them from recognizing Jesus when He was coming. I just offer to you now nothing in myself but the grace of God to you. Will you seek the Lord? Will you rend your heart Will you seek the Lord with all of your heart? Will you confess to Him how your heart has been distracted with other things and preoccupied with other things? How you've loved other things? Will you just say, Lord, come and renew me. Come and draw me. Help me to know you, God, and to seek your face. Let Him have His way in you tonight, saints. He loves you.
thankful for this message tonight because you know it's so easy it's so easy to get to get distracted in life with the externals where this as this song says what the Lord is looking for more than anything else is our heart he wants us he wants us he wants us way his heart, his heart is for us way more than our heart can ever be for him but as Brother Brandon ministered tonight, he, out of his grace, says, just draw near to me. Draw near to me. And you know that drawing near just begins with the first step. It just begins with the first step. And as it says, sometimes just take one step and the Lord will take 99. He'll take the rest. The Lord loves us tonight. And he doesn't want us to be caught up with the externals as easy as it is. It's so easy to wander. It's so easy to get caught up in the externals. It's so easy. But the Lord is just looking for our heart tonight. He's looking for our heart. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, in, that, in, that, in Hebrews, in Hebrews, the Bible tells us that, that um, in Hebrews chapter 4, that His throne of grace is open. In a sense, the door is open. Jesus did it at the cross. The veil was rent. The door is open to the throne of grace. But sometimes, and it's so easy to do it, even as a minister, it's so easy to do it that we, that we are satisfied with an open door where the Lord is saying, I've opened the door. Come on in. Come on in. The door is open. I did it. I, I opened the door. The veil is rent. I've opened the door. I opened a door that you could never open by your works, by your merit, or anything you can do. Jesus, I did it. The door is open. But sometimes, again, it's so easy. We get satisfied with an open door. And just say, well, the door is open. That's good enough for me. No, no, no. Well, the Lord is saying, yeah, I opened the door for you to have intimacy, to, to know you, and for you to know me. The door is open. Come on in. Come on in. And James would talk about it, actually, in the book of James, chapter 2, when he talked about real faith. And he gave Abraham as an example. That Abraham didn't just verbalize his faith that was accounted unto him for righteousness, but in Genesis chapter 22, when the Lord said, Abraham, Abraham, would you give me your son? Would you give me your Isaac? Give me the promise. Give it back to me. And Abraham, out of real faith, it was a, he showed real faith by taking his son Isaac. 
and tell you, say, come on, son, we're going up on the mountain. That mountain ultimately, ultimately was Mount Moriah. Ended up being the same place that Jesus would ultimately be crucified, that same area. And the Lord tonight, through his word, through this word tonight, is calling us, saying that I've opened the door. Come on in. <laughs> Every single day. Hallelujah. Every single day. Do you believe that tonight? Praise God. I know you do. Would you stand to, our, stand to your feet tonight as we, as we close? And, and tonight we're going to take up an offering for Pastor Brandon. And um, I'm going to do it this way uh, for the Katim. I'm just going to put the chair right here. And I encourage you to give tonight. We want to bless Pastor Brandon. We want to bless him. So, Father, tonight we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are drawing us near. You're always drawing us near. Not a moment of the day, Lord, in which you're not drawing us, in which you don't love us, in which the door of grace is not open. And, Lord, we thank you for that tonight. We ask that, God, you would bless this giving, bless Pastor Brandon and his whole family, press down, shaken together, and running over. Bless them in ways they couldn't even imagine, Lord. In the days and weeks and even years to come, bless them, we pray. And we say it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Bring your offering here tonight before you leave. Let's sing it. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. Let's sing it together tonight. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. When it's all about you, yes, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made. It. When it's all about you, yes, it's all about you. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. We invite you back here tomorrow morning at 1030. Amen. Amen. If, amen. A.M. if you can make it. And if so, you should say amen. 1030. Amen. <laughs> A.M. you can make it. But before you leave, I encourage you to love on each other. Say hi to Pastor Brandon as well. But God bless you, and we'll see you. Have a wonderful night. We'll see you back to, tomorrow morning. Amen.